So you need to have validated computer systems. You need to have documentation practices. You need to have methods to uh, manage deviations. And you need to have internal review, uh, reviews. You need to have documentation, prescriptive documents, uh, like uh, study protocols or SOPs, descriptive documents. You need to document who did what and when, what was observed, where were the deviations, who observed the experiments, who documented it, and who approved it. And then how you manage your documents, document control. Technical requirements, trained personnel, adequate facilities, enough storage space, uh, you need to make sure that your climate system is not blowing um, pathogens in your test tubes. Adequate test equipment, where the maintenance records have been maintained so we let you know when it has been maintained. Validated test methods, sampling, um, sampling and chain of custody, and materials. I spoke to a group of scientists, um, lab scientists, where talk about that you need to have your materials you use in your experiments. They have to come either from a trusted, verified source, or you have to uh, analyze, do the analysis yourself before you put it into your, uh, into your ex experiments. The first one is to tear and feather me, because they said, what you're talking here is regulation. It's good mis manufacturing GMP. We are not doing it. We do science here. OK, so what I asked them, I said, OK, so do you stand behind, and these were industry scientists, by the way, do you stand behind your research results when they are reported to our CEO? That was a question that almost offended them. They said, of course we stand behind it. Then I asked the question, OK, then I'm missing something. So how can you stand behind your output if you don't, understand, uh, if you don't know what your input is? Well, they looked at me, and that was a point when they started to change things. So let me come to an end. Let's summarize the issues. There's a lack of common quality standard in biomedical research, which drives poor, reproduci uh, poor reproducibility of biomedical research, which results in a declining productivity of drug development. So what can we do about it? What we can do about it is that we establish a common quality standard for biomedical research. The WHO and the ASQ have published quality guidelines for biomedical research. And my plea is that academia, medical journals, pharmaceutical industry, that they promote these guidelines to improve R&D productivity for the sake of all the patients in the world. And there's not an individual person in this room who has not been and will not be at one point a patient. Thank you for your attention. Any questions after? Questions? Okay. No, no, after, after, after the, the next okay. presentation. Okay. So you just remember, we'll take questions for the panel at the end of Dr. Blaisdell's presentation. Um, so please make notes. Anything you have, we'll, we'll have ample time for that. So let me introduce our next speaker. Dr. Peter Blaisdell is an executive director of global study management at Amgen. And he, he joined Amgen in 1998. Uh, supporting clinical research programs in infectious disease and nephrology. He has since led global teams in conducting pulmonary, cardiovascular, and nephrology outcome studies, successfully executing international phase two and three studies in support of filings, as well as phase four trials providing post-marketing support for a variety of therapies. Uh, before joining Amgen, Peter was a senior project manager at Quintiles in Mountain View office. We conducted cross-functional, he, uh, he coordinated cross-functional teams in the support of phase two through four trials for biotech and large pharma sponsors across a diverse range of therapeutic areas. He has contributed to cross-industry initiatives to expand uh, the demographic diversity of trial enrollment and fast improvement, uh, improved outreach to patient advoc advocacy groups. Dr. Blaisdell has authored both basic research publications and business management articles focusing on the biopharma industry and taught graduate business classes on research management in MBA programs. He holds a PhD in biochemistry from the University of Minnesota, where he also conducted postdoctoral research in microbiology. So great pleasure to have you here, Peter. Thank you very much. We're looking forward to the presentation.
Thanks very much, Ahmed, for a big hand. Oh. <laughs> Save the applause until after you've heard me. <laughs> thanks very much for, for inviting me, and thanks all of you for, for listening. So I think you've gathered from the two previous speakers that, you know, although they were rather different talks, they sort of had maybe one overarching theme. We're facing some real challenges as we think about biomedical research, but yet there are also sort of opportunities, both in terms of thinking about how the quality standards we build into the basic research, but also sort of the methodology about how we think about designing drug development studies, which be can begin to address these challenges. So I guess this talk that I'm going to present sort of may fit into that broad context too as well. It'll be a little more narrowly targeted at clinical research, and we aren't going to get into enormous detail about some particular specialty in medicine or any complicated and esoteric biostatistical principles. This is a broad set of headlines, actually, that hopefully will be sort of resonate with, with the groups here. And maybe if there's another theme tonight, too, that's been underlying a lot of this. I mean, you all are sort of students, PhD, or perhaps uh, medical students, and perhaps even a few sprinkling of business folks in here, too, as well. I was talking to a few of you out in the, uh, the very noisy sort of foyer out there. I can barely hear myself think, actually. but. Uh, but anyway, the point is that a lot of you are sort of wondering perhaps about future careers and so forth. You've, got, you've done a lot of basic research, maybe you want to stay there, and I would highly encourage you to do that. I can promise you it probably isn't going to get a lot easier. The funding probably from governmental sources and private funding sources is going to be every bit as complicated, if not more so, than it, it ever has been. But if you've ever thought about actually joining sort of the dark side, if you will, the industrial side of things, this, you know, there's some things maybe tonight that I can sort of touch on that will give you some sense of what applied research in a pharmaceutical or biotechnology setting might look like. So that may give you some sort of insight into as you, and inform potentially your own career thinking as we, as we talk tonight. So that's hopefully those are the two key points that will sort of resonate with you tonight too as well. So I could have sort of flippantly entitled this, so you want to design a clinical trial, but, but decided not to because it's a more serious topic actually. It, it is actually, uh, we'll talk about clinical research in challenging times, and again, half an hour, 25 minutes now actually is in no way enough time to even begin to touch the tip of the iceberg. Uh, but hopefully, you know, we can give you at least a few headlines and so on, and then also allow during the questioning uh, that will I'm sure inevitably follow for myself and the other two speakers tonight, some good productive discussion. Um, okay, so the agenda quickly will be basically to talk about some of the challenges. Actually, some of them have already been touched on by my, my colleagues here tonight, so we will try to be rather brief about that. In fact, one of my slides actually is verbatim the same as one of the other speakers to as well, showing that I think there's alignment that we've faced some really major challenges in our industry. Uh, some of the re scientific challenges have been touched on too as well. I'll try to basically sort of add my flavor to that too as well. Regulatory has been, uh, been briefly noted, and I'll try to expound on that just a bit too, as well as sort of the practical challenges of, of conducting um, applied research. Um, that sort of has some implications about some of the elements of trial design. And again, for the trialists in the group here, including my two sophisticated colleagues, this will look rather elementary. But I think some of the basic principles will hopefully resonate with the folks that are still sort of beginning to sort of understand what biomedical research is really all about. Um, trial design can't be thought of as decoupled from trial conduct. The two are joined at the hip, although many actually, uh, uh, you would think, rather sophisticated companies and academics and so forth often do decouple them. And in fact, often the people that design the studies are not, in fact, the same people that conduct them. Uh, we live in an era of specialization, so some of that is perhaps inevitable and inherent, but there has to be, to be really effective, there has to be close, close alignment between conduct and design in, in research. So if there's another theme that I hope I sort of leave you with tonight, it's you can't take the theory away from the practice and vice versa. You've got to really sort of have the two things work very much together, or you wind up with studies that don't work, frankly. Uh, and then finally, we'll talk about, you know, less the challenges sort of, you know, maybe depress the, the audience. I'll try to talk about some things that actually may sort of, uh, you know, be ways that, from a practical point of view, we can try to address some of those issues. So again, my two previous speakers have talked about challenges, but then ways of confronting those challenges. And I'll try to at least very briefly uh, touch on those in, in my talk, too, as well. Um, so this slide we've actually seen tonight, so I won't belabor it, except to say that it's, it's, it's daunting. It means that basically it costs a billion dollars nowadays, uh, and the curve is going down through the, the foundations of the building, actually, uh, in terms of, of every successful drug that, that is actually marketed. So this obviously encompasses a lot, whole lot of drugs that actually don't work. The amazing thing is that actually the amount of drugs, if I were to show you, superimpose another slide 
on top of this if my PowerPoint skills were more adept. I could show you actually that the rate of FDA approvals for new drugs has stayed fairly constant actually. So despite the fact that we're a lot less efficient than we used to be, we've somehow, some way, managed to continue developing drugs at more or less the same pace. But that's not going to continue. It is not possible. There's not enough money in the universe uh, to basically continue developing drugs if they all cost a billion and it's getting more expensive, not less, as we go along. So this is, uh, frankly, a, a major challenge, in fact, that we're really facing as an industry. And it, ironically, as some of my previous colleagues uh, or speakers have alluded to, it's at a time when actually we know a hell of a lot more about basic research. We've got a very sophisticated, under, a much more sophisticated understanding of, of the basic science. But when I was a PhD student, and I won't tell you how many years ago, but it was a couple decades back. If I'd asked myself back then what I would have thought we would be seeing now in terms of like cancer research and cardiology, I would have thought these things would have been much further, we would have been much further along. We are a long way along. I don't mean to dismiss uh, the important and really substantial research we've done, but it's, it's very much the case that our, our knowledge is still imperfect and our ability to deploy the knowledge that we do have to develop actually usable and reasonably effective medic medicines is still somewhat lacking, and that's sort of an area that I think we have to confront as an industry if we're to hope to, to proceed for forward. There are a couple of reasons for that. Actually, actually, there are many, many reasons for that. A few of them I'll touch on here, and again, the sophisticates in the audience will, will smile to themselves because there are probably many other ones that are, that are up there too. But the fact is that some of the simpler targets, the low-hanging fruit, if you will, have already been picked. The easy stuff has been done, and the reason that things cost a lot more nowadays is because the more elegant and more interesting and maybe more, more important biological issues are often harder and more complicated and more expensive to actually delve into. They may ultimately hold promise of actually doing, uh, some making major sort of paradigm shifts in terms of our thinking. But at the moment, we're sort of struggling with the fact that research is lengthy often and very costly uh, because, frankly, we're trying to deal with some pretty damned complicated issues. Um, interestingly enough, this is also superimposed over another trend. In the old days, if I'd been up here 10, 15 years ago, I would have talked to you about blockbuster drugs and how one drug could address, you know, populations of millions or billions of people and so forth. That's actually not the case as much any longer. It still is in some areas. Certainly lipid-lowering medications will affect, you know, hopefully benefit large groups of populations. But particularly in the area of cancer and I think increasingly in other areas, it's become an era of personalized drugs, which means that basically, and that's great for the patient. I mean, who wants to be dosed with a drug that works in a population but doesn't work in you? Then you're suffering the, 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 the side effects potentially and gaining no particular benefit. And that's often a very common problem, and so uh, that, that actually drugs work beautifully well in perhaps 30 or 40 percent of the patients, and actually sort of moderately well in maybe another 20 to 30 percent, and really not at all, or actually may in fact, in fact be harmful, in fact, in, the, in, in another group of patients. Genomics and other, you know, sort of advances in our basic understanding allow us to be much more targeted. So now, when we think about entry criteria for our protocols and our studies, we can be far more targeted. That's great. Again, if you're, if you're a patient, and actually also for a drug developer in some ways, it allows you to pick patients who are actually really going to benefit. You may be able to reduce your sample size, and you can get your medicine to people who are really going to benefit and not, in fact, administer your medicine to people who really won't benefit from it. But it does mean, though, that the payoff, if you will, because it's a business as well as a sort of a mission to develop new medicines, may mean that there's simply, you know, some things you might have tackled a couple of decades ago because the potential market might be very large. You now know the market is actually not so large. So I, I, I think orphan drugs is probably too strong a phrase there, but it's a much smaller population than you might have thought otherwise. And that mean, may mean that you're the number of the, the amount of uh, the ability to recoup your expenses, the billion dollars you might have needed to develop your drug, is much reduced. So that's a challenge too, as well. Um, regulatory challenges, and again, this is a bit depressing if you sort of think about these things. But I have a few slides at the end that will hopefully, you know, uh, provide a little more optimism. But uh, as my, my, the previous speaker alluded to, there are in fact daunting challenges from a regulatory point of view, and they are actually. They're logical and inevitable. This is not the FDA or the Europeans or the Latin Americans or the Asian regulatory authorities being evil villains here. On the contrary, I think they're doing legitimate work to try to basically make sure that the populations of patients that we put into our studies are appropriate for our studies and that the right medicines ultimately get out to, uh, to, uh, to patients. However, it does present real challenges for somebody designing a study. We're much more likely nowadays to go after hard endpoints. That means death or cardiovascular morbidity, and that means sometimes actually rather large outcome study. I'm doing a study right now, or helping take part in a study right now, 
that Amgen is conducting, which is enrolling 27,500 patients. That's the size of a small city. And the idea is to look for basically, you know, the benefit of our medication across a population in terms of death and cardiovascular morbidity, heart attacks, strokes, and so forth. That's not, that's a large study, it may be unusually large, but not so unusual. In diabetes, again, the FDA is maybe a little less worried about can you reduce glucose levels and hemoglobin A1C levels, and they're a lot more interested, as they ought to be, in whether actually that translates into, you know, lower rates of death and severe cardiovascular morbidity in those patient populations. Some of that same thinking can inform other therapeutic areas, too, as well. Um, another thing that actually, again, from you as a patient point of view, and as the previous speaker alluded to, we're all going to be patients sooner or later. Maybe some of us already are patients. This is probably, from a patient point of view, a good thing. But from a drug developer's point of view, it means the bar is a bit higher. We're now testing our drugs against um, basically standard of care. In other words, what's the best current standard of care, and can we add something on top of that that will improve your prognosis uh, for survival? But that means you may have to have bigger, longer, more expensive studies to try to make that case. The study, a randomized study uh, design is preferred. Many of you may think that's self-evident and so forth, but actually, I can remember the day at my, very, at my own company, we did open-label studies, in fact, single-arm studies, and they were perfectly acceptable to the FDA for many of our anemia-reducing drugs. So it, it's, not, it's not such a given that you might think that that would be self-evident going back decades. It's in some, to some extent, it's basically something that's been sort of, I think, in the last decade or two has sort of come into its, uh, to the important position that it has. Another factor that actually isn't so much the regulators, but it's the payers, and actually, again, this was touched on briefly uh, in an earlier talk tonight. Fine, the FDA or the Europeans or the Latin Americans and the Asians have all approved your drug. Wonderful. Will their payer bodies pay for your drug? The answer is sometimes not. The NICE, NICE is a group in, in, in England, for example, and basically they're often quite scrupulous, and even if the, uh, the UK Medicines Group and the EMEA have approved your drug, the payers may decide that it's too expensive and the benefit is incremental but not significant enough to actually warrant the significant additional cost that you may have. So that does put even more downward pressure on uh, the, the cost of, of your study, your clinical research program. And then finally, the last bit here. As we've gone further and further and further afield from the U.S. and from Europe, which sort of are the main areas of, up until a decade or two ago, the drug research was conducted. Actually, that's now complicated the issue because you often have mostly aligned but sometimes somewhat competing perspectives from um, various regulatory agencies, for example, in Latin America or in Asia. These groups are getting more and more sophisticated, but they may, be, they may have a slightly different perspective than the FDA or the European regulatory agencies. There are broad efforts to harmonize regulatory um, sorts of uh, thinking across all the regulatory authorities, but we don't have a harmonious regulatory, glo uniform global regulatory environment at all, and that can mean that it's often rather difficult for the trialist as you design your studies to try to basically address and uh, satisfy various complex audiences and different regulatory uh, bodies. It's a solvable problem, but it is a problem you need to think about as you design your study and your program. Uh, the last bit here is, is a bit about practical challenges, and this often gets ignored, but actually trials do fail for design reasons, lots of trials do in fact or they're amended iteratively. In other words, trials that take, you know, three, four, five, six amendments basically until somebody finally gets it right, that is a reason why studies fail. But another reason, and probably I would argue almost as important, or maybe as important, is practical reasons. In other words, the study was actually elegantly designed. The science was really very strong. The clinical expertise and thought leaders that you consulted to, to provide and design your study was actually very robust. But often things, you know, rather sort of more mundane issues can trip it up and then either have the study fail completely or simply take so long to complete that, in fact, by the time it's done, you've essentially been scooped by your competition and somebody else with another drug has overtaken your, your medicine. Um, so these challenges, actually, and I've, I've sort of touched on them already, are aggressive timelines, uh, perhaps more so than academic research. Industrial research is driven completely by timelines. We're really, you know, it's very much the case. There's a very good reason for that. That's the first one. You're trying to get patient, uh, drugs out to help patients, and they're not going to wait. So that's a good reason to do it. The other reason is competition. Frankly, there's somebody else that will eat your lunch for you if you don't get your drug out reasonably rapidly. And another reason, too, on top of that, which is maybe their competition won't have exactly the same drug, but evolving standard of care, the medicines that are actually you know, affecting your patient population may shift. So your, your trial may have been designed you know, in one state of uh, the, the medical expertise in your area, but that then advances. And if your trial takes several years to complete, 
you haven't, you're sort of shooting at a moving target, and the target has now moved past where you are, meaning that your trial may be more of a legacy and a relic than actually pertinent to the, uh, um, the current circumstance. Patent life, obviously, is another one. We won't spend any time on that. I mean, frankly, we are under uh, constrained patent times, and that also provides some, some timeline and urgency to what we do. And also, another feature here that's sort of implicit in the first three items is we're not in the business actually developing good medicines. I mean, obviously, yes, we are. We're actually in the business of getting answers in a hurry. That's the issue. Most of the medicines we try uh, will, will fail, frankly. And we've seen curves that show that. And I think even with some of the best uh, proof of concept activities that hopefully will, the, the, pr the first speaker alluded to, we'll get better at that. But the fact is, most of the stuff that we try just doesn't work. It worked great in animals and so forth, but it doesn't work in people. And the idea, though, is to, to get to the point where we can make a decision quickly as soon as possible and as early in the process as possible to save money and spare very scarce resources so that they can be redeployed to something else that may work a little later on. Another couple of issues that, sort of face, that are sort of practical challenges that we face, and again, uh, I'll have to thank the previous speakers for alluding to this already. Enrollment is a major challenge, as I'm sure you've gathered in our studies. Can you find the patients who you can enroll in your studies? It sounds pretty easy. Wait a minute, there are lots of sick people out there. For your drug, why can't you find tens of thousands of patients? But it turns out to be remarkably hard, and I'll circle back to that point in just a minute. But take my word for it now that, that actually enrolling patients is often quite a challenge. One reason for enrolling the, the difficulty is because there's an enormous amount of public skepticism about our industry. If you had to pick a way to stop a conversation at a cocktail party, tell people you work in sort of, you know, developing drugs and so forth, I guarantee you that people, especially if they're not sort of sophisticated like this, will move away from you quickly. They'll wonder why Aunt Bertha's drugs cost so much and so forth, and then you're stuck in an hour-long discussion about, you know, to justify why clinical research costs so much. We're about as popular, frankly, as gun manufacturers or the tobacco industry. I mean, literally, you can watch, you can see polls, and that's the, that's the situation. So we can be unhappy about that, or we can acknowledge that and try to see if we can't do something to counterbalance that. One way of doing that is by, instead of viewing patients as sort of passive receptacles for our medicines and so forth, to think about partnering with them and their advocacy groups to essentially try to energize enrollment and to try to get some lobbying from sort of the, the, the broader public, at least the patient public, for your studies. Um, as recently as probably even a few years ago, I think that was sort of a bit of a, a novel concept, frankly. I mean, it was the folks in the industry or in academics sort of thought about the design. It was des designed by opinion leaders and statisticians and so forth and very important scientific and medical input, but nobody ever thought much about the patients, frankly. They were just the people that got, got the, the benefit of our thinking. That's still partly the case, and obviously the medical expertise mostly lies with, you know, still within sort of you know, the, the, the thought leaders and so forth that develop your study, but more and more patients are becoming quite sophisticated, and if we can align them with our studies and, and so forth, I think that offers some real benefit. We could spend another whole hour talking about that. That's its own topic and worthy of its own discussion, but I think the point the point's well taken here. And then finally, basically, the last bit here is that of the, the overall process for developing drugs, it certainly is not just clinical research. It's preclinical and basic research and all a, a whole variety of other aspects of, of uh, industrial drug development. But the most expensive part in almost every situ situation is, frankly, clinic the clinical aspect of it. That's, that's a very important part. So as an operational challenge, you as the trialist or the scientist designing your study need to keep that in mind and develop the study not just with elegance and so forth, but also with efficiency and economy and frugality, if I can use that term here. A couple last points in terms of the challenge, uh, the challenges here. We're doing studies more and more, uh, certainly Amgen is, but I think most other companies are doing studies with largely ex-US populations for the simple reason that the patient populations in the US aren't you know, adequate to do the studies in reasonable time. And for the other very good reason that you're not actually developing drugs just for a US population, you're developing, developing them for an international population. My own company right now is in 75 companies, countries, and we're actually a fairly small company versus the Mercks and the Bristol Myers of the world. So we're really much more of a global effort than we ever were. But as I noted earlier, that does create practical challenges to designing your study in a way that can satisfy basically an audience um, uh, that's sort of global in nature. A couple quick points in design, and again, this in no way is, is an exhaustive list. Um, or exhausting list, hopefully. I'll touch on this quickly. The main point, actually, one key distinction between industrial research and academic research or government research is the audience. The audience for us is regulatory authorities. Any other stuff we get out of a study is wonderful. It's, it's terrific if we can basically impress 
you know, the medical community and publications, that's, that's vital. We need their support to, to really understand our medicine and how it can be used. If we can basically you know, convince senior management within the company that it works, that's obviously important too as well. But regulators are the audience. If, if you can't get your, your, if you can't make your study design in such a fashion that it convinces them, you don't actually have a drug. And that's, that's what we're really after here. Whereas in an academic setting, you can pick a topic or an issue that's simply of intellectual interest and curiosity and may be very important in advancing the fundamental knowledge of sort of our uh, of biology and medicine. But it's not, that's the, and if that comes out of this kind of research, that's great, but that's not the primary intent. The primary intent is basically to prove that you've got a drug that is safe and effective in, in, in patients. Design features practicality. I touched on this a bit already, but the one thing to think about, and you guys as you design laboratory work here, or if some of you are trialists, and so forth.